Beyond Donald Trump complaining unjustly about how the legal process works, Fox News is now making up, fabricating things about potential jurors, and Donald Trump is taking these fabrications and now pushing them out and spreading them. How are we not right back in gag order territory? Because that's going to pollute the American people and potential jurors out there. All these things they're saying, they're not true. Absolutely. One of the posts that Donald Trump made today was suggesting that uh, he said liberals are lying to try to sneak their way onto the jury just so that they can convict him. Um, the gag order, I think, covers this. I think that if I were working with Alvin Bragg tomorrow morning when I get back to court, I would be arguing that this is conduct that is covered by the gag order. It included statements directed at jurors or potential jurors. And so I think when you make disparaging comments about people who are in that jury pool, that is covered by the gag order. For the reasons you say, Stephanie, I mean, one is preserving the integrity of the, the process, protecting public confidence in the process, but also protecting the jurors themselves. If people get wind of who they are and believe they've said things that are false to harm Donald Trump, those people could themselves find themselves uh, harassed, threatened, or attacked. And so I think that if I were in Alvin Bragg's shoes, I would be very aggressive on jumping on this tomorrow. McKay, the Washington Post has a, has a pretty extraordinary piece out that's describing this trial as sort of a symbol of Donald Trump's complete break with New York City, right? The place where he built his name. I was actually thinking about it last night, walking up Fifth Avenue past Trump Tower, thinking, you know, when you think like New York City in the 1980s, it's like Donald mm -hmm. Trump in the limo. Like this yeah. trial buries that image. Yeah, I've always thought, and I've written about this for a long time, I've always thought that if there is one kind of rosebud to understanding Trump psychology, it is his uh, New York roots and his specific form of status anxiety that he experienced as a young man <laughs> growing up in the outer boroughs. And and I, I, I say this seriously, like, if you look through the Trump literature, the, the speeches he's given, the books he's written over the years, he constantly returns to this idea that as a young man growing up in a, in a wealthy family, he was always a little bit ashamed that his dad had made his uh, fortune in Queens and Brooklyn. And he always wanted to go to Manhattan, where he felt like that's where everything was happening. And, and as soon as he could, he helped expand the Trump empire into Manhattan. And he really built his entire image around being this sort of figure of Manhattan, a tabloid titan, a guy who was riding in the limo, who was at all the fancy restaurants, the elite clubs. And, and really, he, even at the time, among the city's aristocracy was kind of treated as a rube or an outsider, like a nouveau riche guy. And that always ate at him. And I think that that kind of outer borough status anxiety that he experienced it has, has fueled his revenge march to the White House and really all of his political uh, career. But really, this this trial, I, I, I was struck by it last year when I went to cover his arraignment. This really is kind of the end of his quest for Manhattan's approval in particular. Like, there, there is no coming back from this. This is a full rejection of him uh, by Manhattan. And, and I think for that reason, it's a more personal trial than any of the other trials that he faces. The boy from Queens determined to be king. He did leave the White House and went and led a big life in Florida, but just like Jared and Ivanka, they went to Florida, they went to LA, they live large, but none of them came back to NYC. Barb, the DA made it clear that prosecutors plan to press Trump on his previous New York cases if he decides to take the stand. Why would they do that? What does it have to do with this case? What does E. Jean Carroll or the civil fraud case, what does that have to do with election interference? Well, it doesn't have much to do with the substance of this case, but it does affect Donald Trump's credibility as a witness. So this was part of something that's referred to in New York as a Sandoval hearing after a case by that name. It's a quirk of New York law where the prosecution has to give the defendant notice that if you take the stand and become a witness in this case, not just a defendant, but a witness, we are going to um, try to impeach your credibility with the jury by bringing out acts of prior dishonesty so that the jury can assess your truthfulness when you answer the questions today. And so 
to, to give the defendant that notice and they can make a decision that, well, if these things are going to be uh, brought in front of the jury, maybe I should change my mind and choose not to testify. And so there is a hearing. The judge will decide whether these prior acts are admissible. Um, but I, I think there's... Uh, they, they should be because they are things that tend to go to the credibility of Donald Trump, especially when it's about fraud in a fraud case with an intent to defraud and he's going to be testifying about fraud. I think a jury is entitled to hear those things to assess his credibility as a witness, not to determine whether he's guilty of these crimes because he's committed fraud in the past. All right, Barb, but I'm no stratego. If I'm Alvin Bragg, wouldn't I want Trump to testify? I mean, that's open season uh, on a guy who's lied over and over. Why would I show my hand and potentially spook him so he won't want to testify? I think that would be Bragg's dream to get him on the stand. Maybe yes, maybe no, but it's a legal requirement. And so there are a lot of provisions in the law that are designed to protect the due process rights of the defendant. And so before Donald Trump has to make a decision about whether he'll testify, he's entitled to this notice of the things that Alvin Bragg will, will point out so that he can make an informed choice about whether he ought to take the stand or not. All right, new topic, Yamish. Let's talk about the campaign, because Politico has some pretty extraordinary reporting that Trump's campaign is now, I want to say this slow so people get it, they are now asking for a cut, a financial cut from down-ballot GOP candidates from their fundraising when they use Donald Trump's name and or his image. We know a whole lot of candidates rely on their ties to him, but how big of a windfall will it be for his campaign if they all have to give him a cut? Like, are they going to go for this? Well, it's a really interesting question because you first have to wonder whether or not the candidates are going to actually agree to this. But it really does underscore in some ways how former President Trump is continuing to really make up for the cash gap that he has with President Biden. Now, he held that that fundraiser in Florida. They, his campaign is saying that they raised something like $50 million, which to me is very interesting because it's exactly double what the, what President Biden and President former Presidents Obama and Clinton said they'd raised in New York City at their fundraiser. So I always want to, in some ways, continue to look at that number and, in some ways, wonder whether or not that number is going to pan out. But if you think about the fact that that almost every single Republican candidate um, running across the country, they're going to be trying to run on the coattails of former President Trump. He is someone who has a base that is excited about him. Though he, it's still a small part of, in some ways, the Republican Party, he was able to win basically almost every single primary, except for the one that Nikki Haley won. So in some ways, it really does show you that Republican voters, if you say that you're with Trump, um, as so many Republican candidates are doing across the country, that they're going to be more engaged in wanting to back you. And I was just talking to people in Arizona today, Republicans in Arizona, as well as Democrats because of the abortion law, and they reminded me that there are a lot of Republicans that are still going to be going through state primaries here. So even though we think that somewhat that the general election has started, it's a reminder that there are a lot of Republicans who are going to be trying to beat off primary challenges by using Donald Trump's name. So this could be a large sum of money if Trump is able to actually convince these candidates to give that money to them, that give that cut to him. It's just amazing to me that he's going to take a commission. It's like on the heels of March Madness, he's decided he's going to get in on the name image likeness game and make himself some money. But let's go to the Hill because I want to play what Speaker Johnson said tonight about his plan to put foreign aid bills on the floor in the next few days. I think providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. And I'm willing to take personal risk for that because we have to do the right thing and history will judge us. I do not spend time walking around thinking about the motion to vacate. Yamish, he resisted this move until this week when all of a sudden his job is on the line. What's really going on here? It's really, really interesting. At first, there was this thought that Speaker Johnson, that Republicans wouldn't have sort of the ear that they had for Kevin McCarthy and that he might not actually have his job on the line. It now sounds like maybe there is going to be enough Republicans to possibly threaten his job. I've been talking to some Democrats on the Hill wondering whether or not they're going to help save him. And a number of them told me, well, I would vote for Hakeem Jeffries. What do I look like 
saving a Republican. But there is this sense now that if he's putting up this foreign aid, that you might get a couple of Democrats who are going to side with him in order to, to really say thank you for putting up this aid bill. But it is really this, this kind of interesting moment where we now have the Republicans sort of having deja vu, where you have yet another Republican Speaker of the House saying, look, I want to put forward things that, as a caucus, we should be getting behind. And he's not able to get a, the number of Republicans he needs um, to, to save his job. So it's going to be really interesting, especially the way that he's talking about this. Let's remember, you just played that sound. Speaker Johnson is saying that he's not really worried about the motion to vacate when you have someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene um, and possibly other Republicans saying, well, we're waving it in your face that we might use this against you. In some ways, it shows that there's a hard bit to this job, but if they do, for some reason, get rid of Speaker Johnson, who else is going to want this job now, given the fact that they've now basically, well, they would have run through two speakers of the House um, because of this motion to vacate, Stephanie? Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.